is May 14, 1948 in Tel Aviv. Here, before an excited crowd, a man with flowing gray hair reads a document that will go down in history as the declaration of the establishment of the State of Israel. After 2,000 years of oppression, the Jews are declaring that they are once again taking charge of their state. In Palestine, in the territory which, as the Bible says, God himself promised them, it's an incredible story in which David Ben-Gurion plays a central role. It was he who worked for over 40 years to create the state. It was he who tirelessly encouraged his people. And it was he who will now lead the state as its first prime minister. However, he has no idea what is yet to come. Declaring a state is one thing, but maintaining it is another. The man was born in 1886 as David Grun, in the Jewish community of Polish town of Plonsk, near Warsaw. His parents were not poor, they owned two houses. David will receive a good education. His grandfather will teach him the language of the Bible, Hebrew, which is not quite usual, because otherwise everyone here speaks Yiddish. When David is 10, his family is strongly influenced by a pamphlet called The Jewish State, by the journalist Theodore Herzl. In it, he said that Jews should move away from Europe, where in past centuries they have been met only with brutal waves of anti-Semitism. He suggested they should go back to Palestine, from where they were expelled by the Romans in the first century AD. But Argentina, Cyprus, or Uganda have also been brought up as options. The idea thrills the family, especially teenage David. He and his friends form a society where they speak only Hebrew among themselves, because that's how they think the new state should be set. Their decision to leave Europe was hastened by the wave of Eastern European pogroms, during which thousands of people died in Odessa, Kyiv, Kishinev, and other cities. There was nothing stopping them. So, in September 1916, with his father's financial support, David Grin stepped off a boat in the Promised Land, the Palestine. Initial fascination is quickly replaced with reality. At the time, only 50,000 Jews were living in Palestine, who either remained there from biblical times or had moved there in recent years due to the impact of Theodore Herzl. The territory has belonged to the Ottoman Empire for five centuries, and the vast majority of the population is made up of Palestinian Arabs who, quite understandably, do not like the new arrivals. At first, David Grun works as a peasant picking apples or grapes, starving, eventually getting malaria, and being told by a doctor that if he stays in Palestine, he probably won't survive. But he prevails and stays. He says if we are to live in this country, we must work it with our own hands. Eventually, he would find work in Jerusalem, and due to his advanced level of Hebrew, he became a newspaper editor and a Jewish activist. He also wanted a Hebrew name, so he chose his new surname in honor of the first century anti-Roman rebellion leader Joseph Ben-Gurion. Everything changes with World War I. The Ottomans abandon their Jew-friendly policy, David is deported to Egypt, and he flees across the ocean to New York. Here he begins a recruitment campaign for Jews to return to Palestine. As it soon turns out, the biggest catch is a certain Paula Moonweiss, an American Jew originally from Minsk, whom David marries. They will have one son and two daughters together, and she will stand by him for the rest of his life, even though he will be almost useless for family life. As their children would say, mom built the family and dad built the state. Back to our story. The end of First World War brings about a radical change in Palestine. From the Ottomans, who lost the war, Great Britain takes over the territory, and it, through the so-called Balfour Declaration, named after Foreign Minister Arthur Balfour, gives approval to the idea of a Jewish state in Palestine. So this is what happens. Thousands more Jews begin to arrive from impoverished Europe, 
gradually changing the face of sleepy agricultural Palestine. They buy up land from the Arabs, build new cities. For example, Tel Aviv grows out of nothing, and set up self-sufficient agricultural cooperatives called kibbutzim. It's hasty, and Ben Gurion is helping to organize it. He's great at it. He is particularly good at compromise because, as they say, when five Jews get together, they have six opinions on everything. Ben Gurion first heads the Histadrut Jewish Union in 1929. Then in 1939, he merges several left wing parties into one, called Mapai, which becomes the strongest Jewish party in the country. Then in 1935, by which time his hair is slowly turning white, he becomes chairman of the Jewish Agency, the unofficial government of the Jews in British Palestine. By that time, he has nearly half a million Jewish immigrants behind him, almost half the population here. No wonder, therefore, that in 1939, an Arab uprising breaks out, with Palestinians attacking Jewish towns and settlements. Ben Gurion is moderate, ordering restraint to the militia called the Haganah. But chaos is gripping the whole country. Civil war threatens to break out, and so the British make a shocking turn at the helm. In May of 1939, the British government announces a new policy, written in the so-called White Paper, which de facto excludes the creation of a Jewish state, and, in addition, radically limits Jewish immigration to Palestine to a mere 15,000 people a year. For context, at that time, Adolf Hitler was already in full swing with his anti-Semitic policies. The Kristallnacht pogrom had already taken place in Germany. Synagogues had already been leaving the world. Many European Jews would now like to flee to Palestine, but it is no longer possible. Ben-Gurion faces an incredibly difficult choice. He cannot fight the British alongside the greatest anti-Semite, Hitler, in the Second World War. And so, once again, he chooses to compromise. He establishes the Jewish Brigade to help the British fight the Nazis, but he also encourages illegal immigration into the country. The situation reaches absurd proportions after the end of the war, when the whole world knows about the horrors of the Holocaust. Boats filled with people who, often by a miracle, survived the hell of the Nazi camps arrive on Palestinian shores, and the British refuse to let them in. Instead, they are locked them up again behind barbed wire in refugee camps and suburbs. Even Ben-Gurion's nerves are going to snap. For a limited time, he will ally himself with the most radical Jewish resistance groups called Irgun and Lechi, and sanctify armed struggle, including terrorist methods. This culminates in the bombing of the British headquarters in Jerusalem's King David Hotel, in which 91 people are killed. It is too much for the British. They decide to leave Palestine on May 15, 1948. And what happens thereafter is to be decided by the newly formed United Nations. So the UN Commission comes up with a proposal. We will divide Palestine into two states, a Jewish state and an Arab state. The proposed borders are bizarre, as the Jewish state would have a 45% Arab minority, but Ben-Gurion agrees. To the opponents, of whom there are many, he repeats, we have nothing now, and this is better than nothing. The Arabs, on the other hand, reject any Jewish claim to Palestinian land and reject the plan as a whole. On November 29, 1947, a vote is taken at the United Nations. The Jews need the votes of 31 nations. All the great powers are in favor, except Britain. And all the Arab states are against, of course. The resolution the result. of the Duck Committee for Palestine was adopted by 33 votes, 13 against, 10 abstentions. It's a great moment. Jews in Palestine celebrate mightily, Ben-Gurion and others dancing a traditional dance called the Hora. Six months later, on the 14th of May, 1948, a few hours before the British finally leave Palestine, 
David Ben-Gurion reads the Declaration of Independence in Tel Aviv. Israel kam ha'am ha-Yehudi, ba'utzva d'muto ha-ruchnit ha-datit v'amdinit. According to the Declaration, the new state will be called Israel, although there have been proposals to name it Judea or Zion, and it will be a republic with a democratic form of government, free elections, and freedom of religion. The only Jewish specifics will be that on Saturday, the Sabbath, will be free. State institutions will have to cook kosher food, and Orthodox believers will not have to do military service. Ben Gurion is 62 years old, and the dream of many generations of Jews seems to be coming true. Otherwise, it's all just on paper for now. Israel will have to fight for its existence. The very next day, war will break out with all its Arab neighbors. Ben-Gurion is both prime and defense minister, and is responsible for the fighting. He has only 30,000 men, and is opposed by the regular armies of seven neighboring states. Yet he can do it. Thanks to hasty purchases of heavy weapons and aircraft, especially from Czechoslovakia, and the rapid arming of more men, disaster is averted. Within a year, thanks to huge disagreements in the Arab coalition too, the war for independence is over. Israel not only exists, but has 21% more territory than the original UN plan attributed to it. The flip side of the coin is that 700,000 Palestinians have to leave their homes and live in refugee camps in neighboring countries. And this sense of historical injustice on the Arab side will lead to more and more Arab-Israeli wars. But let's return to David Ben-Gurion. He will be Israel's prime minister, with little interruption, for 13 years. During his reign he will stabilize the country, and solve the economic crisis of the 50s, by accepting West German compensation for the Holocaust. His negotiations with German Chancellor Adenauer seven years after the end of the war spark a wave of huge protests in the country, but Ben-Gurion withstands them. Then, in 1956, he will also endure the so-called Suez Crisis, during which he will unsuccessfully help the British and French to control the Suez Canal in Egypt. And it will also be he who, in the year 1960, sends Israeli commandos to Argentina to kidnap Adolf Eichmann the Nazi organizer of the Holocaust. His execution would become the only one in the history of the State of Israel. Ben-Gurion himself voluntarily resigns from the Prime Minister's chair in 1963. At the age of 77, he and his wife Paula will move to a kibbutz in the Negev Desert in southern Israel. He'll say, here is our future, because we're not even taking anyone's place here. Living in a simple bungalow and working in the field seems to take him back 60 years, when he made the biggest decision of his life. To leave his homeland to find, build, and defend a new one. For himself, and for a nation that had only dreamed of such a thing for 2,000 years.